When discussing the pioneering nations of early aviation, well, Lithuania isn't one that generally pops up much in the discussion. But in fact, that nation had a very keen appreciation of the importance of aeronautic development, especially for military purposes. Plus, it was also blessed, albeit briefly, with a talented designer and pilot who sought to give the tiny country fighters their at least on par with those of other countries, and indeed better than many, Jurgis Dobkovicius. Again, my standard apologies to the people of Lithuania for all the name butchering that is about to occur. But a little historical context to start with. The modern nation of Lithuania was born out of the chaos of the First World War and the collapse of both the Russian and German empires. What is now Lithuania had been part of the Russian Empire for centuries before effectively being taken over by Germany during the war. The surrender of Germany saw Lithuania now effectively cut adrift and so the country created its first government as an independent state in November 1918. It also had to create a military in quick order as well, as Lithuania faced invasions from the Soviet Bolsheviks, then the Bermontians, who were basically a massive warband of white Russians and German Freikorps combined, and finally in 1920, an invasion by Poland for good measure. Needless to say, these bloody beginnings gave the Lithuanians a keen awareness of their vulnerabilities and an appreciation for modern weapon systems, especially air power. And into this came Dobkovicius. Born in 1900 in St. Petersburg, Dobkovicius volunteered for service in the new Lithuanian army in 1919. Because of the technical education that he had received in Russia, he was swiftly put in for pilot training at the new Lithuanian Air Force Academy and appointed as commander of the country's first, and indeed only, fighter squadron. Dobkovicius would fly 24 missions against the Poles, but with the end of the conflict and peace finally being achieved in late 1920, he was able to start exploring, building his own aircraft. Here we have a minor issue with the historical record, because though we know what designs Dobkovicius created, we don't have much in the way of technical details. The reason for this is that it appears that Dobkovicius kept much of the information on his designs in his head. He was reputed to be capable of playing chess against two opponents at once, without a board, so it's fair to say his memory was pretty good. But it does leave some gaps in the historical record, unfortunately. However, we do know that Dobkovicius proceeded to design and build Lithuania's first aircraft, the Dobby-1 in 1922. All the Harry Potter fans, shut up and sit down. The Dobby-1 was a small, light aircraft that was powered by a tiny 30 horsepower engine, and basically served as Dobkovicius's introduction to designing and building aircraft. He very swiftly followed up with the Dobby-2, a two-seater which was intended for military use as a reconnaissance aircraft. When this first flew in 1923, it demonstrated an impressive speed of 154 miles per hour and garnered international attention, particularly as it was the product of a country that had built precisely one aircraft previously. It also inspired Dobkovicius to explore and improve in his knowledge of aircraft design, and so he resigned his commission in the army and enlisted at the Aeronautic School in Paris. It was while conducting his studies here that he designed his piece de resistance, a single-seat fighter that was intended to match performance with anything else flying at the time, the Dobby 3. This began construction at the Lithuanian Air Force workshops in June 1924. Now, I will be honest, details in English seem to be practically non-existent, so my research for this is composed of online articles in Lithuanian and Russian that I've run through Google Translate. And so if there are any Lithuanians out there who know more details, feel free to put them in the comments. But the Dobby 3 seems to have been a very innovative design with a range of cutting-edge ideas incorporated. The aircraft was skinned in plywood, with only the flaps covered in fabric, and was, I think, a semi-monocoque design, meaning that the aircraft's skin provided much of its structural strength with minimal internal struts, though I may be wrong with this. Armament was to be two Vickers machine guns either side of the fuselage, though these were not fitted. But a couple of things really stand out just from inspecting the photographs, one obvious and the other less so. The Dobby 3 was a monoplane with a single shoulder-mounted wing, and this had a very distinctive crescent look, that seems to have had both a very thin profile and possibly several kinks 
to give it a sort of double goal wing, though it's hard to be sure from the pictures available. In fact, to be honest, the wing of the Dobby 3 reminds me more of a bird's wing than an aircraft's. Combined with this was the engine cooling system, which apparently was mounted mid-wing in a surface cooled configuration. And that leads us to the big issue for the Dobby 3 and for Dobcovicius, which was that the only engine available was a BMW 3A 6-cylinder that produced at best 185 horsepower. This engine was apparently taken from one of the Lithuanian Air Force's Fokker D7s, and which just a few years before, in 1918, was a truly formidable power plant. But by 1924, it was badly outclassed. As an example, in 1923, the Royal Air Force took into service the Gloucester Grebe. This was powered by a Jaguar 4 radial that produced 400 horsepower. Plainly, the Dobby 3 was going to be struggling to compete with contemporaries with such limited horsepower available itself. But here, the cleverness of Dobcovicius' design shows through. Because while the Grebe could manage a top speed of 152 miles per hour, the Dobby 3 was listed at 160 miles per hour. Now, as already said, the details are all a little sketchy on this aircraft. Plus, any recorded figures is for the aircraft not weighed down with its armament or ammunition. But even so, the Dobby 3 had impressive performance for its day. It seems that Dobcovicius foresaw the future trend of performance trumping agility, as the Dobby 3 was reputed to be both a fast climber and good at altitude, though not as agile as some of its contemporaries. And despite its innovative qualities and the limitations of the infant Lithuanian aircraft industry, it was ready in surprisingly short order. In December 1924, the aircraft was able to conduct a test flight in front of a host of dignitaries, including the head of the army and the Minister of Defence. Dobkovicius took his creation up and put it through its paces, and on returning to land, had a bit of a mishap, a prang in the parlance of the day. Again, I am not sure of the details, but it seems that the weather was not good, and Dobkovicius may not have been able to identify the landing field, and so the Dobby 3 suffered some damage to its right wing, undercarriage and propeller. Not a great start, but it proved the aircraft could fly, though landing, however, does seem to have been an issue. However, future development had to wait as Dobkovicius had to return to Paris to complete his studies, and so the Dobby 3 languished in a shed for a period awaiting its creator's return in 1925. Repairs and improvement began on the aircraft, and an unexpected further delay occurred when Dobkovicius broke his leg writing off the Dobby 1 in a crash on the 1st of December 1925. It took several months before he was recovered enough to attempt another flight, and in June 1926, Dobkovicius took the repaired and improved Dobby 3 up once again. In fact, he had to sneak out of his mother's house via a window because she had made him promise not to fly again after his accident. And indeed, it seems that his mother had had a premonition. Dobkovicius took the Dobby 3 up, but seems to have had difficulty landing, having to abort twice. On his third attempt, he seems to have overshot and hit either an oak tree or some telegraph cables, reports are mixed. But either way, the Dobby 3 crashed and broke up. Dobkovicius was critically injured and died a few hours later in hospital, another casualty of the early days of flight. But the pioneer aviator also helped encourage the efforts of his contemporaries, and Lithuanian design work and construction of military aircraft would continue after Dobkovicius' death, right up until the occupation of the country by the Soviet Union in 1940.